youth, if you, uh, it is your time to head out to your class uh, with, with Pastor Brittany and Jeremiah, so if you want to join them there. And once again, youth, if you want to make sure that you express all the love and appreciation for Jeremiah's hat, his new hat that he purchased, what a great looking hat. Church, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God together? Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, the NRSV, to the church in Thyatira. Uh, the words will come up on the screen. It says this, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, I'm going to pronounce it like five different ways, but it's okay. Uh, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, <laughs> right. These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, your faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her I am throwing into great distress, unless they repent of her doings. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve, but to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod. And when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my Father to the one who can conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has ears listen to the, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Holy Spirit, may we have ears, what you are saying to your church. Let's pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to have a seat. Um, so, I mean, as you've seen from, from the screen, we're, we're, we're in the book of Revelation. And... Um, we're specifically just exploring these letters to the churches that are written um, to in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And I wanted to pause and just acknowledge and celebrate um, and express my gratitude for those that have, have come up to me post-service or just um, in spaces that I've gathered with you throughout the week and have expressed um, that the book of Revelation has been bewildering for you in your own life. Uh, for those of you that have expressed that you have even avoided reading the book of Revelation because it has left you confused and you're not entirely sure what to do uh, with this book that, that is at, at the end of, of Scripture, um, I just want to thank you for your, for your honesty. I want to thank you for, for just being able to come to me and just express that. Um, the Revelation... It pairs well with this comment that I've, I've heard before that all good theology begins with wonder. That all good theology begins in this place where we come before the Lord and say, I don't have it all figured out. Um, and there are aspects of who you are. There are ways that, that I see you revealed in the pages of Scripture that have floored me that have made me uncomfortable, that have discouraged me, but I come before you and say, I don't have it all figured out. So give me greater insight to who you are. I think a continued prayer, like I've mentioned before, is that we would, that we would gain revelation, understanding of this multifaceted nature of who God is. There will be often times that we come across uh, expressions in, in, in Scripture of who God is, and it'll leave us scratching our heads. And that isn't something to fear as the community of believers, but it's something that we press into. 
And so again, just thank you for that, that those that have come to me and just said, yeah, I'm not sure what to do uh, with this book. But I want to connect that uh, to what we read here to these to the letters to the seven churches that Jesus speaks to in chapters 2 and, and chapter 3. What you'll see specifically on the front end of each word that Jesus gives is that there will be an unveiling, a revelation of who he is that, that he gives to the church that will often, very often, coincide with the word that he's going to speak to the church. So let me bring some examples up to you, for, and it'll just kind of be a, a recap of where we've been over the past three weeks. To the church in Ephesus, Jesus reveals himself as the one who holds the seven stars and the one who walks among the lampstands. And what the word he gives to the church in Ephesus is that if they don't repent of this loveless ethos and culture about them, then he is going to remove their lampstand from their place. Then to the church in Smyrna, Jesus reveals himself, gives a revelation of the fact that he is the one that was dead and is now alive. And to the church in Smyrna, Jesus speaks to a church that is facing affliction and martyrdom. To the church that is facing death, Jesus says, this is from the one who was dead and is now alive. To the church in Pergamum, where we visited last week, Jesus is revealed, it's an unveiling, a revelation of him as the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. And as you go further into that letter to the church in Pergamum, what you read is that the sword that Jesus possesses is in his mouth. And Jesus speaks to a church that lives in a city where Satan's throne is. Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and that is the city that this church has to navigate that is, is, is being influenced by the ways of the one that is a liar and deceiver, and Jesus reveals that he is the one that has words of truth and of life. So the picture of Jesus often connects with the word that Jesus is going to speak. And so now here, pronouncing it for like the sixth different way, Thyatira, Jesus speaks to them, and it says this. He'll, he speaks to them, he says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. These are the words of of holiness and purity. These are the words of refinement, of a refiner's furnace. Have you ever had wordless communication with someone, just right with the way that they look at you with their eyes? Has there ever been a moment where you received a glance from someone and you knew exactly what they wanted to communicate to you? Maybe immediately for some in this room, you're thinking of grandma with chancla in hand looking at you because you've been acting like a fool. But there have been these moments where I have officiated weddings and the bride and the groom are standing there at the altar. And there's, there is a look in their eyes where no words are necessary but everything is being communicated by the way that they're looking at each other. Wordless communication, communication through our eyes. Jesus looks at his church, and in his church is this ferocity, is this purity, is this holiness, and this look in Jesus' eye sees directly into their hearts and into their minds. There are these moments of the pages of the gospel accounts where we're told that just by looking at people, that Jesus was able to perceive the thoughts of their hearts and their minds, that Jesus was able to know everything about them. And there's just this communication that takes place in just the way that Jesus looks at people. The look in his eye communicates so much to them. And then John also reveals to us, as he writes this account, that there's also this stance that Jesus has. 
and this stance that he has. When you look at a translation from Eugene Peterson in the message uh, translation of this passage, he translates it as that Jesus is standing on feet of furnace-fired bronze. The stance here of Jesus is a stance of strength, of holiness, of purity. It is a firm foundation. There is no impurity whatsoever to be, to be seen here in Jesus. He is holy. He is blameless. He is perfect. And it's pictures of Jesus like this, that when you read over the accounts of Scripture, that when, when humanity stands in this picture of God, they are left floored. They are trembling. They are scared. You think of the prophet Isaiah, and it's, we're told that he gets, a, he gets a revelation. He gets a picture of the throne room of heaven. And his, the words out of his mouth in that moment, the prophet of God, is to shout out and exclaim, Woe is me. I'm undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I am of a people of unclean lips. Just earlier, when you get this picture of John standing before Jesus, he says he fell down like one dead. He trembled at this image of Jesus. And here at the front end of this letter to the church in Thyatira, Jesus gives this picture of these, these eyes that are like flames of fire, this stance that is just so strong, this foundation of blameless and purity and holiness. He stands at and he looks at a church that is dealing with idolatry and fornication. And the imagery here is meant to shock them. The imagery here is meant to provoke within them this clarity of sight where they realize everything that they've been tolerating and have been allowing to creep into their lives and the picture of who Jesus is. You're nothing like us. It's meant to cause this reaction, same, the same reaction that it caused in the prophet Isaiah. Woe is me. I'm done. I realize what I've been engaged with. I realize what I've been standing on. And my feet are not like furnace-fired bronze. My feet are like unstable clay. My feet are like sand. What I stand upon isn't going to sustain me. And Jesus becomes for the church in Thyatira this picture of a firm foundation. He is what you can build your life upon. He is what you should be standing upon. But there's something incredible here about this picture, this revelation of who Jesus is and the first words that come out of his mouth. Here he is with eyes like flame of fire. Can you imagine? You're dealing with, you're tolerating fornication and idolatry. And this God who stands before you with eyes like flames of fire is looking at you with feet pure and blameless. And he looks at you. And the first words out of his mouth are this. I know your works, your love. I know your love. And an incredible pairing takes place here. There's suddenly you realize that there's some themes that are happening over these letters to the churches in Revelation. Because to the church in Ephesus, if you want to go to that slide, Jesus says this to them. I know, listen now, I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. 
to the church in Ephesus, Jesus is writing to them and saying, you're not, you're not tolerating fornication. You're not tolerating idolatry. That if there's any teacher among you that is teaching a destructive way, you're getting rid of them. But I have this against you. There's no culture of love amongst you. There's no love about who you are. And now to the church in Thyatira, Jesus comes and speaks to them. I know your works. I know your love, your faith, your servants, and your patience and endurance. But I, I know that your last works are greater than the first. While, while the church of Ephesus is forgetting the love that they had at first, the, the church in Thyatira loves and it's getting greater and greater. There's more love that's about them. But to, but to them, he says, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel. And what you discover here is this. Love and holiness need to be married together. Because where the church often finds itself is that we can have this lifeless teaching, this loveless teaching about being pure. We can have what, what Dallas Willard calls the gospel of sin management, that all that God is concerned with is that you are not a dirty person. And we can teach behavior modification in a very loveless way. But there's also this other deception that we can fall into that we can love, we can have a relentless welcome about us, but we have no expectation for formation and transformation to happen in people's lives. And the word from Jesus to his church is that we are to be a loving people and we are to be a blameless people. That those two are meant to be merged together. And so Jesus isn't, it isn't, he isn't coming forward and saying, listen, you're dealing with idolatry and fornication, and it isn't this, this lifeless, killjoy kind of posture, but what you get here is this understanding that what God is for is God is for love, he's for delight, he's for flourishing, he's for us standing on a firm foundation in life. And so he comes before this church that is dealing with that is tolerating this immorality that is penetrating their community. And he first acknowledges that there's posture of love amongst them, and, and, he, and, and he, comment, he, he, he gives accommodation to that. And so he comes to them and says, you're, you're, you're tolerating this woman Jezebel which can be a loaded word. Um, but I want to read to you from John Stott's book. By the way, a great read. I'm probably going to put it on the resources for the book of Revelation. He writes a book just specifically on Revelations chapter 2 and 3. And he gives us a definition of Jezebel, a little bit of historical understanding. He says, Queen Jezebel was the wife of that weak king Ahab. If you go back to the historic writings in the Jewish scriptures, you'll in, you can look it up, um, King Ahab and Jezebel uh, there. She was a foreigner and had import, imported into Israel her alien cult. Her father, Ethbael, was the priest of Astarte, who had succeeded to the throne of Sidon by murdering his predecessor. Astarte, or Ashtoreth, was the Phoenician equivalent of the Greek goddess Aphrodite and the Roman Venus. Her beastly system had engineered such a complete divorce of morality from religion that it even encouraged gross sexual immorality under the cloak of piety. According to one etymology, Jezebel means pure or chaste, but Jezebel contradicted her name by her character and by her behavior. So historically, Jezebel is, 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 was a real person, and John uses, or Jesus uses, 
the, the imagery of Jezebel to saying, you are embracing a teaching that is divorcing morality and worship. And, and, and over the history of the church, what you realize is that the church is regularly dealing with this false teaching called Gnosticism. And this Gnosticism, it, it believes this. It believes that it's, this is super summarized and very generalized. Um, but, but the understanding is, is that what the Gnostics believed is that the physical world was what was false and the spiritual world was what really mattered. And so there were two ways that this teaching could be lived out. One was, is that because the physical world was, was what was fake, it needed to be beaten into submission. It, it, it needed to be avoided. It needed, you needed to fast away from any desires of the flesh. So anything, any, any desires that, that you had were just automatically contributed to be, to be evil and they needed to be thwarted, and the spirit is what needed to, be, to, be, to, to conquer and to win. The other way that Gnosticism was lived out was because the spirit was, was, wasn't what was real, and the spirit what, is what was real, then it didn't matter what you did with your body. It didn't matter. You can engage with whatever you wanted because the flesh was temporary. The flesh wasn't going to last, and it was the spirit that really mattered. And this teaching began to get filtered in to the teaching of the church. So suddenly the church just began to think, well, Jesus is spirit, so it doesn't matter what we engage our bodies with. And what the Bible is regularly communicating to us, it's, in, it's, it's Easter. What is, what is one of the one of the most imperative things that we learn about Easter is that Jesus raises with his body. And when he ascends, he still has his body. And why the resurrection and ascension is, 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 is highlighted for us, and one of the reasons that it's highlighted for us is that we realize is that our worship and our bodies are meant to be mingled together. And, and, and what you find in the book of Revelation isn't that one day we're going to be, we're going to escape our bodies and we're going to be these cloud-like figures, spirit in the sky with harps worshiping God. But the teaching of Scripture is, is that our bodies will be raised. And the teaching of Scripture is, is the presence of God and the reign of God, heaven, is going to come down to earth. And there will be a day where our bodies are raised and we will abide in a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, is the, script, is the language that Scripture uses, with very real physical bodies we will be with God for all of eternity. So it matters what we do with our bodies. And this is, the, this is what John is, is teaching against here. This is what Jesus is speaking against here. Thyatira, you are, you're engaging your bodies in places of idolatry and fornication. And what you do with your bodies matters. What you do with your bodies matter. And so let's talk about food and sex. Maybe not a slide that you were anticipating would be up on uh, here at church this morning. But what Jesus is confronting here for the church is how you approach food and sex matter. And, and the understanding that we have when we look over the pages of Scripture is that God is a God of delight. He, he has come so that we might have life and life to the full. For those of you that were in the room for our fall series that we went through, we went through a sermon series called The Table. 
And in this table, we talked about a theology of meals. And one of the things that we recognized over that sermon series is this, is that food is unnecessarily good. Food doesn't need to taste as good as it tastes. Right? You think about just a really good meal right now. I think about a friend posting a picture of a ribeye steak on social media. Right? You think about that and you realize that the table is meant to be this place where we are reminded that God is a God of delight. And the same is meant to be said of sex. That God is a God of delight. And he has made us to experience joy, delight, fulfillment, pleasure, and ecstasy. He has designed us in a way so that we would enjoy his good creation. He didn't make a black and white world. He made it in vibrant color where we would be in this constant place of just discovering and seeing that he is good. And the temptation that the church falls into here is that they, by divorcing the material world from the spiritual world, what they do is, is they compartmentalize God from all the experiences that God designed for them to fully enjoy under his good design. And, and to the church in Thyatira, he speaks in them, listen, holiness in your approach to food and sex matter. Because what they were doing is that they were delighting in the ways of the gods of their city. And it was affecting them, and it was impacting them. They ate at the table of Artemis. And while we're just talking about these two categories, food and sex, the understanding was is that this can begin to filter into, all, into the church in so many other ways. There were other gods that they were worshiping, the gods of war and the like, gods of, uh, of love, and they, they, were, they were worshiping at the table of these gods. And, and it's a message to us as well that we might not say Jupiter and Zeus and Artemis, but we recognize is that we as well are regularly tempted to follow the ways of the gods of the world around us, that materialism and love and war and empire also entice us, that we also eat at those tables. And what we need to recognize is that we cannot compartmentalize God away from the ways that we engage in the world around us. But he is the God of the universe. And so how we engage in every area of our life matters. Let me dive forward quite a bit and just avoid quite a bit of, script, uh, of the sermon that was laid out there, but... I want to fast forward to this observation that John Stott also makes in his book, What Christ Thinks of the Church. He makes this incredible observation about this, this note to, to Thyatira. He says, the scene of her wickedness will be the scene of her judgment. Her bed will become a bed of judgment. Right, Jesus speaks to the church in Thyatira, and he says, I'm going to throw Jezebel and her actions onto a bed, and anyone who lays with her will be in a place of despair. And what John Stott is observing here by saying that her bed of sin will become a bed of judgment, he's observing the nature of sin in that eventually it will destroy us. And if we keep allowing or tolerating the ways of the other gods of the world around us to be a part and embedded in our lives well eventually that'll be the bed that we're sleeping in and that'll be what we're consumed by jesus is telling thyatira listen you're tolerating jezebel and it's having a formative effect on your lives. 
Her bed of sin will become a bed of judgment. You keep sleeping in that bed, and you'll soon realize that being in that bed is destroying you. A couple of quotes from you, for you. It's the Ken-ism that we've shared so much here. Be careful of who you are, because when you're older, you'll be more of it. And bank robber Dalton Russell in the movie Inside Man that we started this sermon series with, this quote, is the further you run from your sins, the more exhausted you are when they catch up with you. And they do. And, and Jesus speaks to a church that says, listen, there's good things that are happening. There's love and there's perseverance and there are good acts that are happening amongst you. But you're tolerating something. You're allowing something to creep into your life. And if it continues, it'll destroy you. It's been observed in this passage that we can give God this name, that he's the heart knower. His eyes, those flames of fire, they see the human heart and the human mind. He, with his eyes, can see into the depth of our lives. And he can see what's influencing us. He can see what's inspiring us. He can see what is speaking to our hearts and to our imaginations. He can see what we're allowing to, to shape and form our desires. And God, the heart knower, like he does with Cain and Abel, right? He comes before Cain and he says, hey, sin is knocking on your door and it wants to master you. And God, the heart knower, knocks on all of our doors regularly and says, hey, I see this thing that I would love to refine, that I would love to bring through the furnace of my shepherding care. I think the regular call upon the church is that we would come before God, the heart knower, and we would say, search me. Test me. Know if there's any offensive way within me and lead me in the path of everlasting. That we would just regularly come before the Lord and, and, and God who, who we can come before, God who is who has the throne of grace and is available to us in our time of need, that we can come before him and say, God, is there anything in my life that I'm tolerating? and that you would like to visit? Are there ways that you see my heart and my mind that you would want to visit here in this moment? Church, would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace that is readily available to us. We thank you for that your, that your spirit speaks to the church out of this place of love. We thank you that while the enemy seeks to steal, to kill, and destroy, you are a God that seeks so that we would have life and life to the full. And so, Father, we pray that, that, that you would just lead us into the fullness of life. And so, Lord, we, we come before you and say, Lord, if there's any area of our life that you would want to visit, if there's anything that you would like to speak to, Lord, we are open to it. Have your way in our lives, and would we find uh, you who is the God who, who delights you, who, who is a God that, that enjoys. Um, may we know your joy and delight this morning. Uh, we pray that in your name.
Well, church, um, earlier this week, to those of you who are on the, the prayer chain, we sent out an email asking you to pray for um, Pastor Kuka. She's um, so Mike, Pastor Mike Pasquale uh, pastors Lemon Grove Foursquare Church, which is um, one of our sister churches, so Lemon Grove, just down the road. Um, but Kuka went into the hospital with pneumonia, ended up in ICU, um, and yesterday afternoon we got um, a message from her husband, Mike, that she passed away. Um, and so just wanted to take some time here this morning to pray for the Lemon Grove Church, uh, to pray for her husband, Mike, and for their daughters. Um, Kuka was loved and adored <laughs> by her husband, Mike, by their uh, daughters, and by their church. Um, she was a really wonderful, um, loving woman, and she's going to really be missed. Um, so would you join us uh, this morning as we lift them up? Lord, we... Um, God, we come before you with, with hearts that are, are broken. Um, we come before you just with the questions of, of why. Uh, God, we don't understand um, why you didn't um, bring healing in the way that, that we were longing for, the way that we were praying for. And, and so, God, we come with those, those questions and with heavy hearts. Um, and we lift up the Lemon Grove Church. Lord, we lift up Pastor Mike. We lift up their daughters. Um, God, we bring them before you, and we pray right now, even for that congregation as they're gathered together um, just down the road from us. Lord, we pray that your presence would be felt amongst them. Lord, that they would know your comfort. Um, they would know your face shining on them. Lord, that over these coming weeks and months as they're processing through their grief, Lord, that, that you would be that firm foundation under their feet. God, that they would be able to come with their questions and their hurt, with their anger, with their sorrow, and that they would find your arms open wide. Lord, that, that you would hold them tight. And God, especially for Pastor Mike, we pray that you would bring comfort, God, that he would know the, the loving arms of his father holding him now and in the days that are to come. God, we pray that you would put Pastor Mike and the Lemon Grove Church on our hearts in these upcoming weeks and that we would take time to, to pray and intercede on their behalf. Lord, we thank you for Kuka's life. Lord, we thank you for the impact that she had on so many people. Lord, we thank you for her love and we pray that, that those who loved her and those who were loved by her would know you in a real and powerful way in these coming days, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.